Our evening uh, this evening is, is led and uh, animated by Lori Manhart. So please, Lori Manhart. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. What does our world need right now? What are we hungry for? We have a world that is hungry for God, and we have a real shortage in our world at this point in time of heroes. We need to see saints. So tonight we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about the message, the messengers, and the means with a heavy focus on messengers, the second aspect of this. And in order to do anything for the Lord, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do this on our own. To start this um, discussion, the message, of course, is the gospel. I don't see anybody here who's as old as I am, but I'll take a try. Did anybody in here go to a Catholic elementary school and have a Baltimore catechism? By any, you did? Okay, stand up. I'm gonna quiz you. Why did God make you? God made us to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world and be happy with him in the next. Excellent. Great class. You did a great job. Um, what, are we, what are we built for? We're built for heaven. We want to get to heaven. And the only chance we have in heaven is to be saints. We can't be angels. They're spirits. Please don't write in your obituary, Grandma is an angel now. She's not. She's a saint or she's not there. The only beings that we know of in heaven are God. And despite what Shirley MacLaine says, you can't be God. That is already taken. There are angels, there are spirits, they're already there. So the remainder of those in heaven are saints. And we want to be saints. So first of all, the message. The message is the gospel. God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. He wants you to live with him forever in heaven. Sin wrecks the plan. Original sin and our personal sins. This is not a word we talk about much any longer, is it? Someone wrote the book, I think it was Menninger, Dr. Menninger wrote a book in the 60s called Whatever Happened to Sin? It's still around. Open your newspaper, look at the TV. Sin breaks our fellowship with God. The only one who can reconcile us to God is our Lord Jesus Christ. True God and true man. He paid the price to reconcile us to God. That's the message. It's simple, but it's not easy. If we want to get to heaven, we repent of our sins, we accept baptism, and we obey Jesus. And when we fall, we go to confession. And we restore ourselves to relationship with him. And that's how we get to heaven. And it's a long road, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do it. Now, I want to tell you the story of um, two saints. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Bible study later, but I want to recall to your, collect, um, to your reflection two saints, two stories that I just learned recently. You all know the Saint Catherine Labouré. We have a French sister here. She knows the story. Sister Catherine Labouré was living in the convent in Rue de Bac when in the middle of the night she was awakened by a small child who said, hurry, go to the chapel, someone is waiting for you. And when she arrived in the chapel, who was sitting in the priest's chair but the Blessed Virgin Mother? And the Blessed Virgin Mother spoke to her. And she said to her, come closer, dear. And so Sister Catherine Labore took a few baby steps. And then the Blessed Mother said, no, come closer, dear. So she came a little bit closer. And then the Blessed Mother said to her, 
put your head on my lap. And I've never in any of the Marian apparitions ever heard of the Blessed Mother inviting anyone to touch her. But that's exactly what the Blessed Mother did. And what Jesus did to his disciples, he let them come very close to him. St. John at the Last Supper was leaning his head upon Jesus' breast. So if you don't remember anything else tonight, remember that our job is to come closer. Come closer to Jesus and come closer to Mary. Now, some of you may have had Marian devotion since you were a young child. And some of us, when we were young children, thought Mary is sinless, Mary is perfect, Mary is pure, Mary is holy. What would she ever want to do with me? I'm not any of those things. And then we look at the foot of the cross and we see the beloved John and we see the Blessed Mother and who else do we see? Mary Magdalene. We don't know much about her, but we know that she was not pure and holy and sinless and perfect. And yet, the Blessed Mother accepted her. And together, they comforted one another at the foot of the cross. So I would invite you, if you're not perfect, and if you're not sinless, like the rest of us, the Blessed Mother still invites you to have relationship with her. And if we can draw closer to Jesus and closer to Mary, we can be better messengers. The second example I'd like to give you is another saint, Saint Alphonsus Liguri. And I didn't know this story, but Saint Alphonsus Liguri was a priest who started the Redemptorist Order. But apparently as a young man, he got very sick and he got crippling arthritis and he was going blind at age 60. And the Holy Father appointed him a bishop. And he said, Holy Father, I can't be a bishop. I can't take care of these people. I can't even take care of myself. I can hardly see. Listen to this line. The Holy Father said, Alphonsus, if even your shadow were to fall upon these people, it would be enough to convert the whole city. If even your shadow. So I think what we can understand from that is evangelism involves saints. It involves people who know Jesus and love him and want to serve him and whose example is so profound that people are converted by just wanting to be with you and to know who you know. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay, so we need to be a saint. Now I'm gonna give you four examples of contemporary people. These are real people. The first two I will not tell you their real names, they're deceased. There will be two poor examples and two excellent examples. And I would invite you to reflect on whether any of these characteristics might be evident in your own life. The first is a very, was a very good Catholic layman, a husband and a father of 10 children. He worked hard, he supported his family. They went to mass every Sunday. He sent his children to very good schools, um, very expensive, uh, excellent boys' schools and girls' schools. After college, one of his daughters came to live with me. I lived in Ann Arbor, and my family had a household where some single adults came to live with us. And it was time for Lent. So we had a household meeting, and I said, what should we do for Lent? And one of the young men was Armenian Orthodox. And he said, I think we should have an or Armenian Orthodox fast. And I said, OK, great, what is that? He said, well, we don't eat any meat, eggs, fish, or dairy products, or eggs. And I said, John, what's left? Like beans and rice? We have children in this house. And then there was a young woman, and she said, I love Lent, but I hate Easter. And I said, that's impossible. Easter is the most important feast in the Christian year. How can you hate Easter? That's impossible. She said, well, my father was a wonderful man. He was a very good 
and a loving father. And every Lent, he would give up alcohol. And when my father was sober, he was so loving and good and kind. And immediately when we came back from Mass on Easter, he would tie one on. And the rest of the year was very painful for us. And when I thought about that, I wondered in our own lives, we're just coming off of Lent now. And you may have had a very good Lent. Maybe you did the stuff you've done since you were a little child, you know, give up movies or candy or something. And some of us have experienced a Lent where God invited you to give up a vice and you quit smoking cigarettes, or he invited you to uh, do something new, perhaps go to daily mass. And you went to daily mass through Lent and you continued on. And I'm offering wondering if this particular brother had accepted the grace of Lent all year long, what it might have done to his witness, to his family. It's just a question. A few years ago, I was, um, I thought I heard the Lord tell me to go for a walk during Lent. That's not something I did. To wake up early in the morning. I live in Florida, so we'd, I'd walk at 6 o'clock in the morning before sunrise because you don't want to get a lot of rays and get melanomas and all that stuff. Well, for years, spiritual directors have told me that I needed to sit down and listen to the Lord for 20 minutes. And as a docile and obedient young woman who wants to be a good disciple of Jesus, I said, are you nuts? I can't even sit still for five minutes. How am I going to sit still for 20 minutes and listen to the Lord? And here's my problem. I have monkey brain. So as soon as I sit down to listen to the Lord, the first monkey says, if you don't take the clothes out of the dryer right now, they're going to be wrinkled. And the second monkey says, you forgot to pay that bill. And if you don't pay it right now, you're going to have a late fee. And the third monkey says, you didn't take anything out of the freezer for dinner tonight. And by the time I do all the things the monkeys tell me to do, I haven't heard anything from the Lord. So this particular Lent, I decided I would go for a walk in the morning with my rosary. And you know what happened? The monkeys stayed home. I was able to hear the Lord. It was an invitation from him. So I would encourage you to think back on your Lenten observances. What did the Lord tell you to do? And is he inviting you to continue in the Easter season some virtue that he's drawing into you or to send some vice away that he doesn't want you to have? Okay, so that's one example. The second example is a woman, and this man is now deceased, and I pray God that he's in heaven because his children love him extraordinarily. The second example is also someone who's deceased, but a real person. We'll call her Jane. That's not a real name. But about 25 years ago, uh, Jane is a Protestant lady who knows her Bible inside and out. She can tell you every chapter and verse. I can't do that. I know what it says, and I know roughly where to find it, but I can't tell you the chapter and the verse. So I was playing tennis with a third friend of ours, and I said, you know, uh, Jane and I are planning to have a Bible study in her home in the fall, and we thought you might like to join us. And without skipping a beat, this woman said, I would never go to a Bible study with Jane. She is the meanest woman in town. She never has a kind word to say about anyone. She's negative and critical and judgmental and a gossip, and I mean for saying so. And I felt like the wind was knocked out of me, but I realized that everything that she was saying was true. And I realized that some of those things were true for me as well. And if I was going to be any kind of a witness, some things needed to change. So those are two bad examples. Now I'm going to give you two excellent examples. And you will notice that these are stories. I've given you lots of handouts, but Jesus was a storyteller. And we remember stories. Mark Twain, who we believe was not a Christian, said, Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son is the best short story ever written. And I agree. It's true. We all know the prodigal son. We all know, even if you've never seen a Bible, never opened a Bible, you know what a good Samaritan is. Because that's what Jesus taught us. 
So the next uh, little vignette I'm going to share with you is about a young girl, five years old. Now there's a couple that lives in Steubenville named Mike and Alicia Hernan. They have 10 children. And one time, Alicia said, Mike, I'm really boxed in tomorrow. Could you please give me some help? And he said, sure, Alicia, what do you need? And she said, well, tomorrow is little Mary's first day of kindergarten. And I wanted to bring her to school, but I have doctor's appointments for the older children to get their school physicals. And if I cancel the appointment, it'll be weeks before I get another one. And her school is on your way to work. So Mike said, sure, I'm happy to take her to school. So first thing in the morning, he buckles Mary into the van, gets into the van, and he decides he's going to have a conversation with his five-year-old. So he said, well, Mary, today is your first day of school. Are you nervous? And she said, oh, no, Daddy, I'm happy. And he said, you're happy? Why are you happy? And she said, well, because, Daddy, today I'm going to see all my friends. And he said, but Mary, we have moved to a new neighborhood. We haven't met any of the families yet. You don't know any of the children in your class. And she said, that's true, Daddy. I have not met any of the children in my class, but I love each and every one, and they're all my friends. <laughs> and I heard that story, and I thought, I want to meet Mary Hernan. <laughs> and then the second thought I had was, no, I want to be Mary Hernan. Can you imagine what it would be like for high school students and college students to go into a group and to say, you're all my friends and I love you even before I met you? That I would submit to you is the nature of God. He loves us. He just loves each of us. So I think that's an example if a five-year-old can be a witness to the love of God, Shouldn't we be able to do that? Shouldn't we be able to be that kind of a witness? Can you imagine what this classroom will be like when that little girl shows up with all the love she has in her heart for all of these children she doesn't even know? The next person I'm going to tell you about is somebody you can see on your brochure. In your packet, you have a lot of stuff. One of them is a very colorful brochure. If you pull it out, you'll see somebody in the corner of the page in the uh, lower right-hand corner is a woman by the name of Sharon Doran. Before her name, her, she married, her name was Sharon Lewandowski. She was one of the five Lewandowski sin singers of the, they sang for polka bands in the Midwest. Their father was a Polish-American farmer, and when Cardinal Wojtyla was elevated to the, to the Pope, they, he called all of his children into the farmhouse and they knelt on the linoleum floor in the kitchen to pray the rosary of thanksgiving as the father wept. So she's a good Catholic girl. She married Steve. He was in medical school. They moved to Ann Arbor for a neurosurgery residency. God blessed them with uh, three little boys. She was pregnant with her fourth child. She went into the hospital and had a lump on her leg. And when she went for a baby visit, she said, could you just take that ultrasound wand and check this out? And what they found was a malignant sarcoma of her bone. So the doctors came in and said, as soon as this baby is born, we're amputating your leg. And she said, OK, I think I can be a good wife and a good mom with one leg. And then somebody came in and said, you're tall. Sharon is like 5'10". We can take 18 inches out of your femur and we'll take some of your iliac crest and both of your fibula bones from your lower legs and we're going to build the bone. But you will have to be on bed rest for 18 months with four little boys and a newborn. Not being able to do laundry or shopping or meal preparation or anything. And they prayed about it and they decided that's what they would do. And then, uh, and she did very well. And then the doctors told her, whatever you do, don't even think about getting pregnant because your body cannot handle the weight of a baby, can't handle the weight of pregnancy, and the hormones of pregnancy will cause cancer cells to grow. 
So don't even think about it. So Sharon and Steve went to the doctors a year later and they said, doctor, we did exactly what you told us to do. We didn't even think. <laughs> and the doctor said, well, you, you need to terminate. And she said, no way. I know God is giving me my baby girl. I have four boys. I know God is giving me my baby girl. And nine months later, John Paul was born. <laughs> so Sharon has five little boys. She, they finished the um, neurosurgery residency, and she moved to Omaha, Nebraska, where her husband had a position in neurosurgery. And she was teaching an interfaith Bible study like I was. I was teaching a Bible study where Protestants and Catholics came together. And one year we had a Bible study school in Ann Arbor. Bishop Leeson came. Sharon was in the front row with her laptop computer, copying down every word. And I walked back to her with the first true prophecy of my life. And I said, Sharon, when you do a Catholic Bible study, you're going to be awesome. That was years ago. She moved to Omaha. The bishop found out she was there and had this big Bible study. The bishop called her and said, Sharon, I'd like you to do a Catholic Bible study in our diocese um, at the Jesuit High School Auditorium. And she said, okay, we'll make a novena. Let's make a nine-day novena about the Bible study. She and the bishop are praying their novena. The fifth day, she gets diagnosed with malignant melanoma. So she called the bishop and said, all bets are off. Um, I have this malignant melanoma. And the bishop says to her, wait, 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 wait. If they can surgically remove it, and you don't need chemo, and you don't need radiation, will you do it? And she said, sure, I will do that. So guess what happened? <laughs> they surgically removed it. She showed up to do Catholic Bible study. 480 people showed up and she has a waiting list of 50, including about a boatload of Protestants who want to come with their spouses. And she called me up and she said, Lori, do you have 480 copies of the Synoptics? I said, Sharon, I'm not sure even the publishing house printed 480 <laughs> copies, but if you want them, oh, we will get them. And she has, done this Bible study in Omaha, the bishop in Lincoln called her and said, we want to live stream your Bible study into our diocese. There are three different dioceses now. She has a children's program. And I'm thinking, Lord, this is really amazing. And the, the story is the reason it's not the means, it's not the message, it's the gospel message that we know it's a particular tool, it's the messenger. Sharon Doran has, is well acquainted with suffering. She's a vibrant, dynamic, happy Christian. She is exactly the person that we need to share the love of Jesus with a needy world. And she's knocking the cover off the ball. And my prophecy was fulfilled. She's awesome. When I came across and said, when you do a Catholic study, you're going to be awesome. She is awesome. So let's look at some of the things that you have in your, um, in, your, in your packet. The first thing I want you to look at is why we have a need for evangelization. Let me see if I can get this to move. Um, there is a little chart in your, it looks like this. Why we need evangelization. Do you see this little chart? Let's look at some of these findings. And I have a little, uh, I want to just highlight a few areas here on this chart that will show us what we need. Um, you can see I'm comparing the Catholic situation in 1970 and 2017. It takes a while for uh, the statistics to be correlated. This is uh, correlated by CARA at the Georgetown University. And as you can see, in 1970, in the United States, there were 51 million Catholics. And now, in 2017, there are 74 million Catholics. That looks really good at first glance until you look at the next figure. 
There were one million baptisms in 1970. We would expect to see more baptisms with more people in the culture. And what we see is that the baptisms have gone down 699,000. Now, here's a real troubling statistic. Weddings. In 1970, Catholic sacramental marriages, there were 426,000. That's down by about uh, 25 to 30%. Now 144,000 marriages. The Catholic kids are not getting married. They're not starting families. And if they do get married, it may be on the beach or in the city hall, and it's not in a church. And in my opinion, marriage, the vocation of matrimony is just too doggone hard to try to do without all the graces of the sacrament. Any vocation is hard without the graces of the sacrament, I think we could say. But it really behooves a young couple, if you want to make it for 50 years, it's great to have all the graces you can get. Uh, mass attendance in 1970, about 48% of Catholics went to Mass every Sunday. Uh, now it's about 23%. And that's a big problem, and that means we need to evangelize. So what do we need to do to evangelize? And who can fix this problem? Well, we cannot do it, obviously. So there's a little handout in here that says, um, hmm, where's the handout that says, do you know Jesus? Or do you know about him? This is a really important um, handout, I think, because in order to solve this problem, we need to recognize that some of us thought, well, if I had the right program, if I just brought the right tools, I would fix it. But this is a problem that can only be fixed by Jesus. He only has the power to change hearts, to draw people to himself, to pour forth the grace that we need to transform our world. And this is a revelation to me. I'm one of nine children, two of us go to mass. And for a lot of my life I thought, wow, if my sister could only read this book, if my brother could only go to Alpha or Christ Life or Curcio, or that would be it. And what the Lord has been telling me was, if only you would pray and fast for them. And so the orientation needs to look to Jesus first. And first, we need to know Jesus personally. Personally. It can't just be a corporate thing where I go to Mass and it's fire insurance if there is a hell, and I go to Mass and I check the box and I give my envelope, I won't end up there. Um, we need to move beyond that to what the early church had when they really experience Jesus. So what we need is prayer, study, and action. Um, those of you who are cursistas have heard that. Uh, prayer, study, and action. And I've got a few quotes here that are important. The first one from Mother Teresa, I think, is very crit critical. I mean, she had so many beautiful religious sisters, and she said to her sisters, to her sisters who are working with the poor, I, want, I worry that some of you have not really met Jesus one to one. You and Jesus never give up the pursuit of this intimate contact with Jesus as a real living person, not just an idea. So we need to grow in intimacy with Jesus we need to be able to be humble enough to say, Jesus, I know about you. I've known about you since I was a little child. I need to know you. I need to hear you. I need to be able to speak to you. We're all, you know, prayer is talking and listening to God. Some of us are a lot better at talking than listening, right? At least I was. We need to listen to God. We need to hear what he has to say to each of us personally. What needs to change in me? What are you pleased with, God? What, what needs to change? What can I do better? Um, John Paul II, St. John Paul II said, catechesis without personal attachment to Jesus falls on deaf ears. 
So if we can have the best catechetical materials on the planet, if we don't know Jesus, we don't love Jesus, we don't share Jesus, we have nothing to offer to those who are hungry for him. We need to fall in love with Jesus and truly desire to worship him and receive his body at mass. This is a totally different orientation for our teenagers who say, I don't go to mass, I don't get anything out of it. Uh, this is not a commodity. You're getting Jesus. We go there to give something. We give worship. We give him what he's due. This is God. This is not a rock concert. It's not entertainment. This is not a Broadway play. This is worship. We give. And then he gives us more than we can ever imagine. He gives us his very self, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And then Pope Benedict XVI, I like this one. Being Christian is not the result of an ethical duty or a lofty idea, but an encounter with a real person who gives life direction. And then Pope Francis encourages us to return love to God by loving him, by being closer to him, and by letting God love us. So we need to do all of those things. Um, I think that we can, we can see that what we're talking about is really becoming a saint. We, we have a church that really needs saints. We need to know Jesus, we need to love Jesus in order to be able to share Jesus with others. We need to have that kind of a relationship. We need to be the St. Alphonsus Lord Gouris, who your very smile can convert someone. Your very nature can convert someone. Um, uh, we need to have that relationship or else the best program in, in the world isn't going to bring people to Jesus. Our prayer, our fasting, and our witness will bring people to Jesus. Okay, the Holy Spirit, the Bible in you. You should have um, a little hand out there. Um, what we need to pray is, God help us, come Lord Jesus, come Holy Spirit. And we need the Blessed Trinity to help us. So this particular, is, it's a couple of pages, and you can look at this further when you get home. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're reading this in Mass right now in the Acts of the Apostles. We could see, I have some pictures of St. Peter in here that maybe I can get to. St. Peter is such a beautiful example down there. St. Peter was, um, I, I just love St. Peter because he made so many dumb mistakes. He really, he really didn't do a good job in so many areas. Um, he boasted. Uh, he said, even if I must die, I will never deny him. And then, of course, he did deny the Lord. He said, I don't know the man. And here's a nice picture of St. Peter and his remorse, his contrition. Um, we have all denied the Lord in our sin, when in our omissions, when we have been in places and everybody is talking about the politically correct uh, whatever is the fad of the moment, and I am silent, and I don't want to make any waves, and I don't want to upset people, and I want people to like me, and so I'm just like St. Peter. I'm just very, and you know how I feel when I'm done with that? I, I feel like, oh my gosh, you know, what, where, where was my courage? Where is my courage? Where does my courage come from? Where does my strength come from? How did I do this? And what changed St. Peter? Who changed St. Peter? The Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost transformed St. Peter from being somebody who got it wrong, denied the Lord, messed up, to someone who could be courageous for the Lord and ultimately die for him. Um, so we need the Holy Spirit. And I have put in here um, a very, we need to have a Pentecost experience. We are all confirmed. Um, we can see what happened to St. Peter after Pentecost. Um, he preached to 3,000 people. He healed a crippled 
beggar. He broke out of prison. He was beaten for preaching Jesus. And we can see that Jesus gave him the keys to the kingdom. So he, Jesus didn't give up on Peter after he messed up, and he doesn't give up on us when we fail, when we try, and we don't succeed. It's better to have tried and failed than not to have tried at all. And sometimes we can get in the danger of looking at nickels and numbers. You know, we're, we're a success if 100 people come to my program. You know, we're a success if, uh, you know, 480 people come to Sharon's Bible study and um, 60 people come to mine. So, but, you know, I think those 60 souls are important to Jesus. I think they're important to God, those few people. I was telling the sisters earlier, we did a teen Bible study, and we had six or seven teenagers in our living room, and they're all faithful Catholics now, 15 years later. They all love Jesus. They're all serving God in the church. But you could have seen that small number and said, why are you wasting every Wednesday night going to somebody's home, making pizza, making some food for teenagers who need to be fed constantly, um, or they'll eat your house up, you know? Why are you doing this? It's not a success, because success is big, and success is a lot. But I think success is one beggar bringing another beggar to Jesus. If you save one soul, if you help to enable one soul to meet Jesus, that's worth it all. That's worth everything, as far as I'm concerned. That, that's really, um, there is a prayer that I think we could pray right now. It's the miracle prayer, and it's in blue. And I think this is just a beautiful prayer to, uh, I, I like to pray this a lot. You know, you'll see people saying, when did you give your life to Jesus? And you might think, well, wait a minute, I've loved Jesus since I was a child. You know, there wasn't an event, there wasn't a, there wasn't a time, there wasn't, I have a friend who is an evangelist, and he had a dramatic conversion event in college. And his wife, who is a saint, in my opinion, has been a faithful Catholic her whole life. And when they were young, he said, well, you have to, you have, to have a day that you came to Jesus. You have to write it down in your Bible. Now, these are Catholics this day. And she said, okay, you know, if that's what you want me to do, pray this prayer and, and put it in there. But y you don't have to have a day. Um, you can give your life to Jesus every day. You should give your life to Jesus every day. Um, we should be living for him every day. But there may be a time when you think, you know, I have really not willingly considered this. Every Easter, we... Renown, we renew our baptismal promises and renounce Satan and all his works and all his empty promises and say we believe in God. But some of us are doing it a little bit rotely. And some of us aren't really necessarily uh, pondering the words and making that, com that real commitment. So I would encourage you to just, why don't we pray this prayer together? And if you've never prayed a commitment prayer in your life, pray it tonight. And if you have prayed this commitment prayer every day of your life, pray it tonight. And save this prayer to share with someone who does not know the Lord in a deep and a personal way. Lord Jesus, I come before you just as I am. I am sorry for my sins. I repent of all my sins. Please forgive me. In your name, I forgive all others for what they have done against me. I renounce Satan, all evil spirits, and all their works. My God, my Savior, help me, change me, strengthen me in body, soul, and spirit. Come, Lord Jesus, cover me with your precious blood and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I love you, Lord Jesus. I praise you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I will follow you every day of my life. Amen. Mary, my mother, queen of peace, all the angels and all the saints, please help me.
Amen. 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 Lord, hear our prayer. Okay, well, I have um, told you that Jesus was a storyteller. The Bible is full of the story of Jesus, all of the Gospels. It's full of the stories of lots of people in the Bible. And we look at their bad sides and their good sides. We see Peter's sin and we see Peter's redemption. We see David's fall. We see his sin. We see his contrition. We see a lot of people. And what I would encourage you to do is to know your story. And so we're going to work on this tonight. I know you have in the past that some people are very good at sharing their story of when did you experience God personally in your life? Was there an answer to prayer? Was there a retreat weekend? Was there something that brought you close encountering to the living God? One time we had dinner with uh, a golf pro in our town and his wife. And just after dinner, he was sitting across from me and he looked at me and he looked at my husband and he said, well, you both obviously have faith. What's your story? Deer in headlights. Um, that's the best layup that you could ever have. I mean, that's handed out to you. So I think we should be able to tell our story in four or five minutes. We're all average people. Most of us are average lay people. We're not spectacular. We're not movie stars. We're not rock stars. But we each have been created in the image and likeness of God with a specific person. And we each have an individual story. And I think in heaven, we're going to be able to hear each other's stories. So I want to share with you mine for five minutes. Then we're going to break into small groups. I'm going to give you some quiet time to reflect on yours. And then I'm going to ask you in three to five minutes to share your story with somebody at your table. And we're going to have to uh, mess up our tables a little bit so there are four people at each table. Um, so we'll have enough time to do that, OK? So I am the oldest of nine children born to a blue-collar family in Michigan. Uh, my parents loved each other. They uh, sent us to the Catholic schools. And when I was in the third grade, one of the children in my class said, the reason you don't have any friends is because you're poor. Well, that was a revelation to me because I didn't know I was poor. Um, we didn't have any money, but we had plenty to eat. We had a lovely uh, two-bedroom, one-bath, Cape Cod house that my father had built. We had bunk beds and two cribs in the kids' bedroom until my dad raised the roof. But I can remember praying as a little eight-year-old girl in the bathtub that night, which was a very nice place to pray in my house with that many people. And in the bathtub, I said, Lord, in the first place, you have made me homely. And in the second place, you have made me poor. Clearly, I will never find a husband, so a PhD would be nice. <laughs> and um, that was my little eight-year-old prayer. Uh, I remembered that prayer when I was uh, 30 and earned my PhD. When I was in the ninth grade, Sister Honora told me in the Catholic co-educational high school down the street that I was going to be the sports writer for the school newspaper. And when Sister Honora said something, it happened. Uh, so I would sit in the stands in those days, a little we didn't have computers, and I would write down a, you know, a 10 yard run, a 15 yard penalty, and I saw a boy throw a 60 yard touchdown pass. And I said, Lord, that is the man for me. <laughs> now, I didn't know that Mike Watson was even poorer than I was. He was the youngest of 11 children, I'm the oldest of nine. When we got married, we didn't need to have friends because our family filled up the whole church and the whole hall. And uh, God blessed us with a child. And in 1975, I was pregnant with my second child. And all of a sudden, God gave me the grace to see my sin. And it was ugly. And I came through this time at the tail end of the 60s, which if any of you remember that time, it was incredible confusion some of the stupidest books on the planet that were written at that time I read. And I realized that I had hurt the people that I loved, and I had offended God. 
And I started reading the Bible and I read that God was all merciful and all just. And I said, God, this is impossible. If you're all just, I'm going to hang. If you're all merciful, I'm going to get off. I know I deserve hell, but if you could show me mercy, I'm, I know purgatory would be great. And what I would like is for you to give me a very hard labor now. And at that time, I was working on a PhD in health education. My dissertation was on cardiopulmonary resuscitation competencies. And probably a thousand times I said, if someone's heart stops, you have two to six minutes to begin resuscitation or brain damage will occur. So I went into labor on New Year's Eve, 1975. My first labor was three hours with my son. I was in labor for 36 hours. A doctor came in. I was at the University of Michigan Medical Center in Ann Arbor where I worked. Doctor came in and said, something is terribly wrong and we don't know what. Um, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, the baby's heart rate was lost. I could see the monitor going down, and I knew the baby was dying. And my husband left the room. He was told to leave the room. They would do an emergency section. He knelt down, and he experienced the presence of God the Father, telling him he would be with us. I woke up in the recovery room, and the nurse told me something nurses never say. She said, it took them five minutes for the operating team to get here and three minutes to get the baby out. That's eight minutes. Then the pediatrician came in and said, your baby had an APGAR score of zero at birth and zero 10 minutes later. That means no heart rate, no respiration, no reflexes, blue baby. So I was experienced expecting to have a brain damaged baby. And they said, would you like to hold her? And they put this baby in my arms who had IVs in her head and her foot and was all banged up. And I fell in love. And I decided whatever happened to her would be, I would love her. And I brought her home from the hospital. And to make a long story short, um, she graduated from high school in three years. She graduated from college in three years. She's totally well. She doesn't have any brain damage. And I knew that God's mercy and his justice were far beyond anything I could ever imagine. And I decided from that day on that I could never, ever love him enough. I, it took me a while to get right with God and to understand what he wanted of me. But what happened in that event was that I knew that God was beyond anything that I could imagine. That his love, his generosity, his graciousness, in his justice, he could have given me what I prayed for. I prayed for a hard labor. I got it. He could have sent me home with nothing. I could have gone home and had a, a dead baby. But in his mercy, he lavished me beyond anything that I deserved or hoped for. So. That's my story, and I know that you have a story. I know that God loves you uh, in an amazing way. I know that he's worked in your life in a different way than he's worked in anybody else's life because we're all different individuals. So at this point in time, I'd like you to look in your um, packet, and you have a little handout that says, My Personal Faith Journey. And there are five questions that I'd like you to reflect on. We're going to take about 10 minutes now to reflect on them. And then we're going to take about 15 minutes to share about them. So you can share about one of these or all of these. Just think about your childhood experience of God. Who impacted your spiritual development? Was it a teacher in school, a priest, a parent, a grandparent? When did Jesus become real and personal to you? Was there a significant event, crisis, or answered prayer that brought you to close, closer to God? And this could be uh, an event like uh, a Corsio or um, uh, Christ's life or uh, an event, or it could simply have been going to daily mass or... Um, uh, an experience in adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. It could be anything. Um, it could be seeing a sunrise. Um, and then um, 
By what means are you growing closer to God? How have you come into a personal relationship with God? Um, and if you haven't, how do you hope to? What means can you use? The very beautiful thing is when you lead a Bible study, God blesses you in the process. Question number six, do you feel inadequate or unqualified? Yes. Of course, we all do. If you feel that you're um, adequate or qualified or brilliant or uh, beautiful and holy and lofty and wonderful, <laughs> there's one virtue that um, we might not find in evidence. Okay, the best people to lead a Bible study are those who have the virtue of humility. And those people who have the virtue of humility usually say, well, I'm not adequate, I'm not qualified. And the good news is God qualifies those he calls. And God makes up what's lacking in us. So we don't have to have all the answers. Um, Guess what? Nobody has all the answers. Okay? Much of our faith is a mystery. Um, it's, it's been a mystery. It continues to be a mystery. Um, if you can explain the Trinity, uh, you're doing something that uh, nobody else has been able to do adequately on the face of the earth. Okay, now, will the Holy Spirit make up what is lacking in you? And the last question is very important. Has God provided someone to serve with you? It's really good to have Jesus sent the apostles out two by two, the disciples out two by two. It's good if we're not a one-person show. It's good because someone else can say to me when I'm leading the small group, you know, um, I don't think we heard from everyone in our group tonight. I think um, Susie was probably monopolizing the conversation. And it's usually not Susie, it's usually Lori who's monopolizing the conversation and talking too much. So these are some things that you might think about. There are many good Bible study materials that you can choose from. There are topical studies, there are studies of an entire book, there are different levels. There are some very basic studies, there are intermediate studies. In the back of your uh, handouts, you have about a four-page list of Bible study resources. And those will list lots of resources for you. In my opinion, the person leading the Bible study is as important, if not more important, than the materials that you choose to use. We're constantly looking for the perfect program. The perfect and what we need to find are the perfect saints and humble, holy people who will serve us. I want to tell you three Bible study stories, which I hope will encourage you. About 25 years ago, I was leading a Bible study um, at the Jersey Shore, and we had a group of young moms. And uh, they were 12 nursing mothers. And they would bring their babies with them, and we would do Bible study. And one of the mothers, uh, I think she'll let, actually, she has painted the covers of three of our books. She's an artist. Her name is uh, Melissa Dayton. She painted the cover of David and the Psalms, Moses and the Torah, Acts and Letters. She um, did these beautiful studies. Anyway, Melissa, is anybody in here Spanish speaking? Do we have a Spanish speaking? All right, this is your book. You win a prize. Okay, well, Melissa Dayton was, and she'll let me tell you this story because it's public. Um, she had, uh, before she was married and she went off to college, her mother's a Catholic, her dad's a Protestant, she had sex one time with a boy and got pregnant. And the boy didn't want to marry her. And this was after Roe v. Wade, when most of her friends were having abortions. And she couldn't do that, so she came home to raise her baby. Christopher was born, and the father didn't want to marry her. He was a Protestant. And about four years later, 
He decided that Melissa's a lovely young woman, Christopher was a cute little guy, so they got married. And they had Emily. And Melissa came to our Bible study with Emily, and she discovered that her husband Chip was just a Peter Pan. He loved to play, he was never going to grow up. So she went to the priest and she said, Father, get me out of this marriage. I know I have grounds for an annulment. And fortunately, it was in the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And the priest said, yes, you do have grounds for an annulment, but what I'd like you to do is spend one hour in adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. And she said, well, Father, I have two little kids. Now, he didn't ask the church ladies before he said this to her, because we would have been very upset. But he said, bring them to adoration. So in walked Melissa with Christopher in his matchbox cars and Emily in her little toys as we were trying to play very quietly at St. Catherine's in Spring Lake, all of us church ladies. Well, that one hour of Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament saved her marriage. Melissa and Chip now have eight children. Um, Christopher, who I was very ticked off with for bringing his matchbox cars, um, was ordained to the priesthood last June for the Diocese of Trenton, and I attended his first Mass, and he'll probably close my eyes in death, and the church ladies learned that we should keep our mouths shut when the priest gives um, his penances. So Melissa painted the covers of five or six of our books, and she invited other young mothers to come to Bible study. One of them was named Sandy, and Sandy was raised in a good Catholic family, went away to college, married a Protestant boy who was a surfer dude. Sunday mornings, guess where he was? <laughs> she had two little children, and she tried to bring them to Mass. Now, if you're a mother with two little children, and one of them is just learning how to walk, and is a boy who's running around the church, and the other one is a little girl who's teething, and crying, there's nobody there to help you. None of the women say, let me help you with your baby. So guess what happens? She stopped going to Mass. And then a few years later, she decided, well, maybe she should take the children to church. So she was looking for a church which had child care. And Melissa said, Sandy, come to Bible study. And she brought the children to Bible study and we were doing the Gospel of John, and in the Gospel of John, I just happened to drop in the bulk of Himane Vitae, which was written before Sandy and Melissa were born. They had never heard of it. Sandy came home, looked at her husband and said, Eric, read this. He read it and he said, this is the most beautiful document I've ever read. And Sandy, what are we doing? We drink organic milk. We eat natural foods. What are we doing to our bodies? So they read that and they stopped contracepting. And I moved to Florida. And about two years ago, I came back to New Jersey because two of our grandchildren were receiving First Holy Communion on the same day in two different counties. So we went to Matthew's First Holy Communion at St. Helens in Westfield on Saturday and then Anne at St. Martha's in, Mount Ple in Point Pleasant, I said, we'll go on Sunday with your family for your second First Holy Communion. You can wear your dress and your veil. So we went. It was beautiful, beautiful liturgy. At the end of the Mass, this woman came running up to me and said, Lori, do you remember me? And I said, well, of course, Sandy, I remember you. She said, wait, I want you to meet the two children who were born to us after we read Humani Vitae, and I want you to say hello to Eric, who is now a Catholic who came into the church. So, a means that you might feel called to use in your home or in your parish is a Bible study. And we love to go into people's homes. This is not something new. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come to your house tonight. Jesus went to the house of Martha and Mary. He was comfortable with the rich. He was comfortable with the poor. You can tell me I have a very tiny house. That's okay. God isn't saying, only invite people to your home if you live on a mansion on the beach. 
You know, if you live in a tiny little home, it's okay. It's okay for people to sit around on sofas. I would invite you to consider how you could use Bible study as a tool for evangelism. There are a number of ways. We've done Bible study with teenagers. Um, teenagers, you may need to modify the program for the group you're working with. We have done Bible studies with moms with babies, young children. We've done a free child care program. I was telling Father uh, John and Maureen earlier, when we were at the shore, there was one mother, um, uh, Maria, she has uh, three little boys who are the most active boys on this planet. They could uh, disarm a terrorist cell in about 35 <laughs> seconds. They are just, they are terror on steroids. And somebody said, Maria, there's a, uh, they're doing a Bible study down at St. Mark's and they have free child care. And without skipping a beat, Maria said, honey, I would come to a cut your arm off party if they had free child care. <laughs> I will be there. You know, and Maria had wonderful, there were wonderful miracles that took place. Little Emily, Melissa's second daughter, was born with a tumor on her eye. They said um, they could remove the tumor, but she would always have a scar. And the young moms, one of them said, wait a minute, I have some Lord's water. The other said, let's all pray. Let's pour the Lord's water on her. Let's pray that she doesn't have a scar. They did the surgery. There's no scar. Emily's eye is in the um, ophthalmology textbooks now. You know, the mothers prayed. Maria came and said, my, my husband is listening to this acid rock music to wake up in the morning. The boys are already crazy. This music makes them even crazier. Please pray that he changes the station. The mothers prayed, and of course, he changed the station, and ultimately he came into the church. And, God works in amazing ways when we just pray, when there's a small group of people who can pray. In our parish in Florida, we have um, a Bible study at night. We have men's groups and women's groups that works better for us. One man stood up, we have pop-up sharings at the end of the uh, session, and he popped up and he said, I am a cradle Catholic and I have stayed in the cradle for 50 years. I'm just now learning my faith. And people will say these amazing things. He said, did you know who confers the sacrament of matrimony in the Catholic Church? And I said, yeah, Tom. It, it, he said, it's the, it's the couple, the husband and wife. I thought the priest was doing that. And you know, we, we can all learn more. We can all learn more. And we can experience as many times as we're studying the Bible, praying the Bible, reading the Bible, God always has more to speak to us. So you can read a passage that you've read maybe a hundred times before, or you've heard it in Mass a hundred times, and all of a sudden you're opening your Bible and it's speaking to your heart about something that you need to do. So what I would invite you to do is just to consider um, those uh, possible areas in which um, you might consider a Bible study as one means of um, personal growth, growing into becoming a saint. Um, we read the Bible because we need it. We need to continually bathe ourselves in God's word. We need all the grace of the sacraments, and we need all the direction of God in our lives. We need accountability. We need brothers and sisters who would say to us the things that we need to hear. The things that we need to hear. You know, if you're... Um, complaining about the parish or the church or whatever every single week, people are probably not going to be excited about coming into the Catholic Church. You know, if you're ragging about the altar society and how you weren't, you were supposed to be the president and they passed you up for somebody else, it's, it's not going to help. And sometimes we don't know how our responses affect people, but we know that we're not going to hear the Holy Father say, if your shadow just fell on these people, the whole city would be converted. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't you just love to hear that? The other thing that I would really encourage you is that I'm always blessed by the saints who were pre-simplex. 
I love um, Father Solanus Casey, who couldn't, um, who got thrown out of the seminary, I don't know how many times, because he couldn't learn the Latin, and he couldn't, they wouldn't let him preach, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but people who came to talk to him were healed. So it's, isn't it interesting how many saints there are that were really simple? Now there were also saints who were brainiacs, okay? St. Thomas Aquinas certainly had a mega, you know, brilliant. That's fabulous, you know? Um, Pope Benedict XVI, if, if I comprehend half of what he's written, I, I will be delighted. I will be thrilled. I can read about one paragraph of his, and that's enough to keep me going for the rest of the day. So, Yes, God has blessed people with brilliance, and he's blessed people who are very simple. And many of the writers of the Bible couldn't read or write. You know, some scholars believe that St. Peter couldn't, which is why St. Mark wrote his gospel. Um, we know that Jeremiah couldn't. That's why he had a scribe of Baruch. So don't be discouraged if you feel like... Uh, I never went to college, I'm not as smart as my brother. Um, we developed the Bible study series and many of the series are there for, so that an average lay person can study them. And uh, I, I wanna tell you one story about a small group that I was in at St. Helens because it's the story of Joni. There were two women in my group. Um, uh, Joni, um, my friend Clara was a nurse and she brought Joni. And Joni was mentally handicapped. And she was probably, had what we would consider an IQ of about 69 or 70. She was borderline. And she came every week. And in my small group, I had a woman who had uh, a master's in five fine arts and was something with the museum. Another lady was an attorney. Another lady had a master's in social work. We had all these heavy hitters in this group, and Clara, who was a nurse, and Joni. And um, we would, in our small group, read the questions. Everybody would read a question, a circle, just like you did in your groups, and then you could answer the question, and you could let somebody else answer it. So Joni, in this like first grade reading, reads the question one word at a time. And I was just ready to say, perhaps someone would like to help Joni to answer this question. And for once in my life, the Holy Spirit grabbed my tongue <laughs> and shut my mouth. And Joni gave the most profoundly beautiful Bible study answer I have ever heard. And we were all stunned. And we all said, Joni, say, say that again so we can write it down. <laughs> and, and, you know, God was showing me something very important. Clara, who brought Joni, was a nurse. She was from New York. She was from a poor family. Her father was an alcoholic. She became a nurse. She had to borrow $20 from the parish priest to buy a uniform so she could graduate. She paid him back with her first salary. Because of her family of origin, she didn't want to have anything to do with men. Never wanted to get married. But she met Sal, and he was a wonderful man, and they fell in love, and they had three boys. And one of them was mentally handicapped. And she told us in the small group one day very casually, we were talking about um, matrimony, and she said Sal was the most wonderful husband and father she could ever have imagined. And she was so blessed that God had given him to her. That summer, uh, Clara had a heart attack and died. And I was in New Jersey, and I couldn't go to the funeral. But I sent her husband a letter, and I told him what Clara had said about him. And about three months later, I was back in Florida. I went to a mass that I ordinarily don't go to. At the kiss of peace, a man turned around and said, are you Lori Manhart? And I said, guilty as charged. And he said, um, I need to talk to you after mass. I said, OK. I said, what is it? He said, did you write me a letter? after Clara died? And I said, yes. He said, did Clara really say that about me? And I said, yes, Sal. She told us all that about you. And he said, she never told me. And he said, I read that letter every day. 
So it was a simple thing in a small group that someone shared that we could repeat and share with somebody else. So what I would just encourage you that there are some things that you can share in Bible study that aren't deep theological insights, but they may be just the blessing that another person will need to draw them closer to God. Mm -hmm.